Hello, everybody. Welcome to C2E2. And welcome to AEW Revolution Weekend. Now, as much as I relish being up here in front of all you people, I know you didn't come to see me. So, oh, hey, thank you. But without any further ado, I would like to introduce three men that put the elite in all elite wrestling. Matt and Nick Jackson, the Young Bucks, and Cody! very specific seating assignments. I noticed. Assigned seats, folks. I can't see everybody. How's everybody doing? Yeah, I think I think it's full, but I can only see about two rows back. Yeah. How about how on the screen? Oh, uh, just a nice ass shot. Does the scarf look weird? Does it look weird? <laughs> okay. The scarf looks good. I'm going to keep wearing it then. Cody's not used to the Chicago weather. It's very cold, guys. It's, it's a Young Buck scarf, so you got to show the YB. There you go. That merch freak in yeah, him, The huh? merch freak. <laughs> merch freak. Well, this has gone off the rails already. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to use the Chicago weather to transition into, because I'm a broadcast pr professional, uh, into how important Chicago is to AEW, not just in terms of the fact that we had our, our first, well, unofficially our first event here with All In, but <laughs> any of you go to All In? Anybody here? Yeah? Oh, wow. So you guys saw the Young Bucks match get cut about 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have such a good picture. No one, I have a picture of me uh, in the very, very two seat go position we had at the time. We had a limited feed to the truck. Uh, this was our first outing on this. Obviously, I, I might not have even been talking to anybody, but I'm sitting next to Dana. It's a, I've, she's seen the picture, but it's one of my favorite pictures because Matt's, Matt's wife is getting very angry as Marty just keeps going over <laughs> and over. And then we sent out a, a civilian man who wasn't even working for us to tell them to go home. He never did, but <laughs> well, great memory. The, I think the they're still wrestling right now. <laughs> <laughs> they're wrestling somewhere at the Sears Center. Center. I mean, the great irony of it all is that you guys were so upset that your match got cut short that you just decided to start your own wrestling promotion. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely a big part of it. <laughs> well, no, so, so All In, that was huge, and it was kind of the, the beta test, the proof of concept that somebody else other than WWE could run uh, a big show. What's going on? What's going on? Are you guys mad? <laughs> did they? I, 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 Why did that guy I, say I follow the old, the old Twizzitter. Did they, they had some bad press yesterday. Is that what's going on? That, does, hey, what, wait, wait a minute. Does, well, let's why, say, let's why does say, Goldberg have heat? Is, okay. New champ? Is there anything nice though? Did something nice happen? Not one thing on the show. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, moving along. <laughs> I really thought there would be a thing. Uh, I'll be damned. All right. Well. So now once. Yeah. We've so gone, All we've In gone was great. Off right? the rails. All In was a great show. <laughs> It was a proof of concept, All In was. Yeah. And, and it wouldn't have been possible without uh, a lot of help. And Chicago is really important to us also because Ryan Barkin and the whole team at Pro Wrestling Tees has been <laughs> such, a, such a big part of Where, getting. Is Barkin in here, though? Guys, if you know Ryan, 
what an ego. <laughs> I like Ryan a lot, but what an ego. <laughs> oh, my God. Sweetheart, though. Great stuff. Sweetheart. Sorry. I didn't mean to. Sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. But going, going further back than that, it was Colt Cabana, really, who... <laughs> Chicago's own Colt Cabana, who came up with this, this kind of self-promotion business model. He hooked up with Ryan. You guys hooked up with Ryan and basically took the world by storm. And that's why we're all sitting here on this stage today. Yeah. Well, also Tony Khan and his money, too. <laughs> yeah, that's honestly somebody I hope you guys all get to meet him. Um, he's floating around here. He moves 100 miles a minute. Uh, if you see like Sour Patch Kids or Candy somewhere, you're near him. He, uh, but guys, give a round of applause for Tony Khan. That guy's the man. And Tony, I mean, I know this building, this, this room is filled with some of the biggest wrestling fans, and we thank you all for being here, but Tony Khan is legit the biggest wrestling fan I've ever met, and it is weird working for somebody that could tell you, uh, Cody, remember when you had that match in, uh, in 2003 at you know, this building in Kansas City, and this was the attendance, and they had this many pay-per-view buys and all this stuff? Like, he has an amazing mind for wrestling. He wrote me a bad review one time uh, on the message boards, like kind of pre, where Twitter and Instagram are so easy now to communicate. This is kind of you had to find where everyone was chatting about wrestling. He wrote a bad review for a match I had at uh, the University of Illinois against Shelton Benjamin, and he reminded me of it. And I, it's, it was, it, he's not wrong. It was a terrible match. What, what was this? Was this CZW fans or what was? What were the forums? Death Valley Driver, I think. Death Valley Driver. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he was telling me like I was gonna, I was gonna find it one day. Like well, I was the, in there. What was the star rating? Oh, I. <sighs> I don't know. Minus? I don't know. I still play coy on the star ratings because, like, you know, that two, two certain people's star ratings meet a lot. And I'm not stupid. I know what, like, the tops. But I always, like, will ask Tony, like, oh, is that, that's good, huh? That's good. Like, when, when one of us do well, like, oh, I didn't know, you know? <laughs> I remember the first time I talked to Tony, he's like, hey, we've actually met before. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, check your text. And he sends me a text message. And it's a picture of him at a, the Long Beach New Japan show. And he's, like, sitting right in the front row, and he's wearing a Bullet Club shirt, and he's too sweeting me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. And he's like, I'm telling you, I'm a huge wrestling fan. I'm like, well, now I believe you. And that's where Tony met Jim Ross for the first time that weekend and met all of you guys for, for the first time. And that really planted a lot of the, the seeds for, for AEW. I mean, what, what would become AEW? And so... From, from All In, that was about uh, 16 months ago, about 14 months ago, the beginning of 2019. Actually, uh, January 1st, 2019, I think it was J Japan time at midnight. Yes. There was a very, very famous, infamous, depending on where you stand, episode of BTE where you guys synchronized your phones <laughs> and you announced Double or Nothing. Yeah, like, it was crazy because we had this, this timer angle and... We knew once the timer ended, we had to give them something. And at the time, we, we, did, we were going back and forth. We're like, do we announce just that we're doing another show? Or do we, had, do we just give them everything? And I want to say it was down to the last day or two when we finally just said, let's announce that we're doing another one. And let's give them AEW, too. Because at that point, the trademarks went out, and everybody was already kind of speculating, and people knew. So we're like, if they already know, let's just how, tell them. How hard, though, was it with the phones in front of the Tokyo Dome? It was impossible. And literally, I mean, the coldest weather imaginable. Yes. And I wasn't wearing this scarf at the time. <laughs> everybody got sick. We I were think. all sick. Masa everybody was got, filming. Masa it. was filming, and randomly, Brian Wittenstein was there, too. <laughs> yeah, his agent. Um, That's right. I forgot My him. agent. Uh... What a nerd. Oh. Took like 10 takes. Too. It took forever. More than 10. More than 10. And Hangman, like the phones weren't lighting up the way they were lighting up. But then when, oh, when you, oh, such a good I had to well, edit it episode. like that night. Remember, it do you guys uploaded. Were, that night though, we, so we finished shooting and we get back to the hotel and we're like, was that even good? I was like, I'm going to try to make it good. And then he, he this guy, 
puts together this just masterpiece. With my kids crying the whole <laughs> night. And we're like, how did you do that? It, you, you created this amazing thing. And now, like, if you watch it, like, I watched it back recently because we just got the new year again, obviously. And I just wanted to go back a year. And, and then I watched this thing. And I'm like, it still gives me chills when you're walking down the hallway and I'm walking down. And, and we all meet at this one place. And the Tokyo Dome was such an important place for us. Uh, Tokyo Dome City, that TGI Fridays, like, we... We made so many decisions in, in this in this room. We called backstage. We made the the maybe the one of the biggest decisions was uh, Chris Jericho was un unsure. Yes, and he wanted us to all meet in Japan and talk and have a real meeting. And our idea of a real meeting was <laughs> TGI Fridays <laughs> backstage. You bought him some mozzarella sticks, and that's what sealed the deal. We would come into TJ Fridays and yell backstage yeah. because the one uh, manager who, and yeah. didn't speak any English, and Kenny wasn't always with us to help translate. Yeah. The one manager knew that meant the party room, yeah. like the private little the room. private space that yeah. wasn't private at all. He would just sh pull a glass door closed. <laughs> that's it. Um, you could hear everything we're saying. <laughs> yeah, I remember Jericho being like really a lot of real questions, and he was very. He had a lot of the, he, always as he, as he does, opinions and things he was talking about. But I, I remember him thinking, like, this is it? Like, where's the, there's not going to, there's no alcohol. There's no, like. No, there's just chicken just, wings, Chris. <laughs> just ordered a bunch of chicken wings, and we're, we're going to make history like that. And then, yeah, backstage, TJI Fridays. And it, it almost became, like, our set on being the elite. It was, like, the max for us. Uh we were like, let's go to TJ Fry's and shoot some you scenes. That, that was the same room right after that G1 that year that we all got together. It was us three, Kenny, Paige. We all said, hey, we're sticking together, and once our contracts are up, we're going to do something uh, together, right? So, I didn't trust the we're all yeah, sticking that, together. Oh, yeah. I every, it, every day the text messages were... Are we? Or are you just? Well, going I, to the you WWE? know, I'm watching. You're going to watching, show up at the Royal Rumble, I'm aren't you? You always go every Royal Rumble. He goes, "What number are you?" I'm watching the Rumble. Tell me. I'm like, and we're got, not going. I got a tweet drafted. Like, oh, he's so good. I'm so proud of them. But I didn't. You know, I probably still have it drafted to this day. Like, oh, congratulations, Kenny. What are you? Ugh. You know, like, <laughs> I would. I was. We had a lot of serious conversations about. We had one on my porch too, where we kept using the brick on my porch, like. Yeah. So this yeah. is where this is, and this, we were doing this weird, terrible math. Yeah, I asked a lot. I was not very trusting of the situation. I think you come from a world, though, that's so different than the world that we come from. So, like, when we just say something, yeah, that, that's what we mean, and we're going to go do it. And, then, like, the world you come from, maybe there's a little more political games or backstabbing and stuff. So, like, we didn't understand that, though, because we were little, never... Huh? There's, there's definitely, in the, in the AEW locker room today, there's definitely, like, the guys that uh, came from Japan, came from the Indies, yes. and then the guys with PTSD. <laughs> yes! Yes! That's, per that's exactly you know what, it. You know what? The mixture works, and yeah. the collaboration... <laughs> The collaboration evens it out. Yeah. As I try to fix what Excalibur just said. Yeah. As Dick tries to yeah, <laughs> put white out over what he just said. I didn't say why they had PTSD. You know who's someone who has a PTSD look about their face all the time, and I and I always tell him I'm like I'm so glad you I'm so glad you're here I'm so glad you came, but I can't tell if he's in love or if he's just in shock at what's happening. Is Malenko. Yeah, is it supposed he's to be got the great? headset on. He's working on the hardest matches of the night. He's talking to the director. He's talking to the producer. And we're just <laughs> screaming things over his shoulder. Tony's just eating so much candy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just such a different setup than maybe Dean was used to. But like, And then if he has any questions, it's almost always like, well, what do you want to do, right, Dean? Uh, oh. Me? Uh, I Me? don't know. <laughs> oh, I really yeah. think about it. You want to well, use my well, idea? You want my idea? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Dean's. If you get Dean's face, I want, I'm just gonna take a random picture of him at the pay per view tomorrow. Tweet it just, out. Just, <laughs> just, just that's the face. Dean Malenko, the Ice Man, legit the funniest guy in the locker room. Oh, God. Dry sense of humor. Oh my goodness. Dry sense yeah. of humor. And he, he, his humor can be tailored towards the audience. A little more adult humor. He's ready to go. If he's around some of the ladies and he's being more respectful, I've heard him and uh, a certain, him and MJF. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. 
Their banter back and forth is pretty is pretty vicious with each other. Very mean to each other. So that's a, if you catch that one, that's a good one. Dean one time said to said an off color joke to MJF, and MJF was shocked, and he's like, "It's okay, I've been Jewish longer than you have." <laughs> Backstage environment is very politically correct at AEW, <laughs> guys. Very. So, you, you release the episode of BTE, everything happens, and actually, uh, a little known fact, I don't know if this has actually been talked about in public before, that, I mean, it was legit January 1st at 12.01 a.m. that um, Chris Harrington and Nick Sobic were there in full Jacksonville Jaguars regalia, sneaking into the... Uh, the country of Japan, and you guys put pen to paper literally as soon as humanly possible. They didn't want to mess around because people were after us, and we. I mean, it's a business, you know. It's like we took, we gave our word, and we meant it. And uh, I think we were excited too, though. We were ready to just make this commitment. We signed the contracts. The one signing is done in TGI Fridays. Yeah, that's true. We took a picture. I think I have it on my phone still. We, we just knew it was time to do this thing, and we were ready for it. And then I remembered that, like, a few days before we went to Japan, it was Tony's idea to do the, the, the press conference in Jacksonville. And I had already arranged this big family trip in Japan. Like, they were going to st- – the kids and, and Nick, too, we were all going to stay over and, you know, hit up Disney and, and have this great time. And Tony's like, no, no, we, you gotta, we got we to gotta go do this, this press conference. you got to come straight to Jacksonville. I'm like, I have my family over this trip. He's like, cut it short. Get to Chicago. I'll send you a jet. We're, we got to do this. And I'm like, okay, let me go tell Dana. <laughs> <laughs> and she wasn't too happy, but she understood the situation. But we we flew th- like for how long? Like it was like we were we were flying forever. It felt like his kids got sick on the jet. We were so excited. We're like our first time on a private jet. We get on the jet. His kids start throwing up everywhere because they were just up for so long and they didn't understand. Right in front of Tony. <laughs> Tony's just Their looking first at us like, eating. yeah. It was pretty embarrassing. So we finally get up, uh, we, we land in Jacksonville and we literally had to go straight to this thing. And we were like, if you look back now, like I got bloodshot eyes. I'm just like, is this even real? Like what's happening? I didn't know what an EVP was. I think I called myself something else on the stage. <laughs> like The three of us did, did right? You did, you did. <laughs> I think you just said vice president. Yeah, we, were just we all got it wrong, right? Which at this point we have like sixty vice presidents <laughs> as well. But everything was moving so fast, though. So, and we were all on this stage, like, is this happening? And like, like, I don't know, seventy-five thousand dollars in pyro shoots off in the, at the stadium, and we're just like, Nick and I were just like, what is going on here? That, but that's legit Tony's parking lot. Yeah, he owns that parking lot. Mm. So he kept saying, and the, like, and the stadium that's yeah, attached and to the, the parking stadium lot. behind it. But he's like, "Oh, we can do whatever we want. It's my parking lot." Oh, and that's that's Tony's home. I was like, "Hey, yeah. Tony, hey, can I send you a Christmas card, man?" He said, "Absolutely." I was like, "Well, can you give me a dress?" And he gives me the the freaking address to the stadium. So I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> so I sent him a card. He's got he's got uh, basically an apartment in the stadium with like a yeah. Murphy bed in it. I mean, he's he, it's yeah. Yeah. that's that's no joke. I mean, he's just a yeah. So we do we do the presser and we're like okay now the the next goal is we have to keep this interesting for six months whatever it was until May twenty fifth until so May that was the tough part and Nick and I we figured we would pop in on a couple of indie shows and show our face and try to spread the word and it went good so everyone started doing it. yeah and we all kind of started doing it. we did a couple at bar wrestling which yeah. was a lot of fun and uh, it was a challenge though to try to stay interesting in that time because nothing was happening. Have you- have you guys seen bar wrestling? You guys know about <laughs> bar wrestling? <laughs> bar wrestling, the first time we went, oh, man. the one where we breached contract to go and we were in the uh, little track suits, yeah. that's the loudest I've ever heard a building. In, to, and it's about, this day. it was about 300 people for to see Hangman Square off with Joey Ryan. But <laughs> I, to this day, yeah. it's the loudest reaction I can ever remember. And then do you remember afterward we ran straight to the car because it was intermission and fans were chasing us like we were the Beatles? <laughs> and we were like, go! We're like, why are we running from the fans? Like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what we were. We, were, we parked at a little kid's karate school, I yeah. remember. <laughs> and then we were sprinting out of there. But you really, there's nowhere to go. You still got to drive. Yeah, right and then we got it. on the freeway. We were like, why did we do that? <laughs> I think it's because of the way we were. Well, we had legit. We had legit broke contract to be there. And yeah. I think we legit were on our. I don't. 
Why were we running? <laughs> I don't know. It, it made it fun, though, right? Yeah, it made it fun. It made it fun. <laughs> but, oh. So, yeah, we tried to keep it interesting for a long time. And while it didn't look like a lot of stuff was going on in, on the surface, we were working like madmen because we had this, this huge wrestling company with about 10 people employed. <laughs> and most of us had no idea what we were doing. Hell, we still probably don't. So it was this just wild time where we were all wearing 25 hats a piece, figuring out how to do this thing. And, and, and somehow, like, we, we planned this show, Double or Nothing. It felt like we planned it for 10 years, by the way. Yeah. So when we finally got to Over, that day. We overplanned it. Right. Like, we, were, we micromanaged every second of this show. So when we finally got to the show, it was just like, oh, my God, can we just get this over with? And how the hell are we ever going to do this weekly, by the way? It takes us this long to do one event. But that was... Weekly, though, has become... Yeah. Formatting weekly has become considerably easier than yeah. formatting that pay-per-view. I don't know what. The reps help, you know. Well, yeah. so, I mean, the other thing that happened, too, is um, in, in that, that five months or six months between the announcement and Double or Nothing, obviously there was a lot of talent announcements, acquisitions, yeah. uh, broadcaster acquisitions. You know. um, but... Not only that, but we were building our production crew and everything, the behind-the-scenes people that, that you guys will never meet, but without them, there is literally no AEW weekly or pay-per-views or anything without the great, the great team of our stage managers, our TV crew, our audio engineers, our pyro guys. And all of these were, you know, it's like at, if you want to put on like, a, like an indie wrestling show, it's like, oh, I got a building, I got a ring, right. uh, somebody's got an iPod with an aux cable, uh, and we just book a bunch of wrestlers. This is a whole different animal. And so that team had to be assembled from scratch, just like the rest of the roster. Right. And when going back to what you, like the broadcast thing, like when we were talking about announcers, we did the all, all in show. And immediately I was like, we need Excalibur to do the show. Because I feel like you bring like a certain awareness and hipness to like the team and your aesthetic looks different. You just, as soon as the camera goes to the desk and we see some guy wearing a mask for some reason, like, you're interested. You're like, this is different. You know what I mean? So when, when we knew we were going to have a television show, I remember you were the first guy I hit up. And I'm like, dude, we need you. Yeah, I don't know if you know how many emails and texts went back and forth with those two talking about. You were a non-believer. No, I wasn't a non-believer. I was a neutral no, until, yeah, you, you supported all, until all in. Yeah. I, was, I was neutral. And then yes. it became, no, 100%. Yeah. And I wanted to... There's some people who really cry for nostalgia, and there's some people who really cr uh, cry for the modern. And that whole point of putting you and Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone together is to bring us all together, is to juxtapose what's old, what's new, what's happening, the whole point. And that's, that says a lot about our actual show, right? Like, we'll see traditional wrestling and then we'll see some new new age 2020 stuff. And it, we bring it all together at the same way. A good snapshot of AEW was just a few, you, you called it a few uh, weeks ago, to watch Tully Blanchard stare across the ring from Orange Cassidy. <laughs> and then to watch Tully fully engage in the pockets and the whole, just, uh, that's it. That's, a, well, that's, that's a AEW. <laughs> and, and then there's, there's the... The subset of, you know, the vocal minority of wrestling fans is like, oh, it's, you know, it's BS. That's not wrestling. That's stupid. Um, I just happened to be talking to Tully. Uh, we, 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 he was in the locker room, and I was talking to him, and I said, I said what did you think about Orange? He said, did you hear that pop that kid got? Yeah. And that's all, that's all that matters is that the people are happy, that the people are entertained, and that's what we set out to do every week is put on an entertaining television show. We we want to we want to serve all fans. Uh, yeah. we, you got to have a variety show. You got to have a little bit for everybody. You can't lean all the way towards anyway. You got to have a little for everybody. And the only right way that's one of the strangest and guys, I guess most ironic thing about the argument, the div division online, uh, the, the argument about well, this is how we're supposed to do it, or this is how it was supposed to be done, or this is what will work. Really, the only gauge on what's what works is what you pop for it's really that's that's the gauge and i'm i'm shocked when there's such an argument because there's no right way to do professional wrestling the only right way is to make sure that the crowd is happy and i hope at aw I hopefully you guys are we're enjoying and having a good time hope so 
So May 25th, Double or Nothing, our first official AEW event, and about 24 hours before the show is supposed to start, Kenny Omega says to our stage manager, hey, can we have some giant poker chips? That's right. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to go on record because there's some confusion about, I love Kenny Omega. <laughs> but sometimes I do not like Kenny Omega. <laughs> Those poker chips yeah. would have cost $2,500, $3,000. With, with like four weeks lead with, time. With the lead time. And I like to do a lot of the clerical emailing and a, a excessively, like, kind of like Leslie Nope style of everything. Like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I'm in. Like, I want to know everything, everything. And I, I want to know everything to a fault. Sometimes I don't need to know everything. Those poker chips would have been a lot less money because they ended up being $7,000. Yeah, and but I don't know why I'm still mad about yeah. that. <laughs> you should have just told us you wanted the poker chips. At, at the end of the day, though, it was definitely worth it. Oh, it was worth it. I mean, the that's... end of the show, what a shot. But yeah, Keith Mitchell came up to me. He goes, is Kenny Omega like this on, like, a weekly basis? <laughs> is this going to be something that we have to, like, look into? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and then we have our first show in D.C., and we, like, get there the day of the show. He's like, yeah, I need a glass coffee table. Like, what? <laughs> and then there was the, uh, the production meeting about uh, three or four weeks in. He's like, yeah, I need a broom wrapped in barbed wire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, during the, the meeting. Be the best the is meeting. I said, I go, well, we'll offline discuss it. He goes, no, let's discuss it now. What type of barbed wire <laughs> does it, is it flammable? Do we, yeah. like, like, and I was thinking, yeah. why? Like, why are you doing this? Like. I think it's fun now because some of these guys from Keith Mitchell's the executive producer. He doesn't like to be mentioned, but please give him a round of He's applause. He yeah. does everything. Yeah. The legit best guy. Some of these guys have been with Keith Mitchell since world class championship wrestling, WCCW in Texas. So when this madman, curly haired Kenny Omega just says, I need a, a barbed wire this this week and glass table this week to, that's one of the most fun things ever is to see their faces uh, are are remember when he was like you know and then all the stage and then we'll climb up on the stage and the guy who builds the stages didn't know yeah. and he was like what what stage are you talking about he got so <laughs> wait, wait, was it fighter fest when I, I came up with the idea of having a bus drive into the thing like the day before yeah he's like we can't have a bus <laughs> the show's tomorrow here's the thing Keith once let a giant tiger walk to the ring with Scott Steiner, so he can never say no, no. to anything. Keith, Keith told us a story about it at, on point. Nitro. The day of the show, someone comes up to him. They're like, you got to get us a monster truck, and you got to have it here in a couple hours. He's like, a monster truck? <laughs> not, not only that, we need four cars for it to destroy. That's right. That's right. That's and, right. and he said, well... We did it that night. Yeah, he's like, we got it done. I'm like, yeah, how? Keith, Keith, uh, Keith Mitchell, Chris Dispenza, uh, Greg Werner, and the bazillion Greg Horn. Like, Bird when, doesn't get enough credit too. Bird. Bird man. Uh, when, when you guys see tomorrow and you uh, you see the setup for Revolution, and everything. These guys are pros, pros. Yep. They don't do it based on any other pre-existing wrestling out there. They're making this show completely with no expectations are standard or bar they make the show just to be the best to them yep. and they're wonderful so tim the director man tim yeah, walbert, tim walbert yeah. great director he's unbelievable and yeah i mean cody you touched on it this is we have no we have no blueprint there's no prototype for what we're doing and so everything is unique and these guys are our, our production crew all these they have creative freedom they have just as much freedom as the wrestlers yeah. do in terms of the stage, the lighting, the camera angles, all these things that you you see that are unique to... Wait till you see the stage tomorrow, by the way. Oh, that's right. I haven't seen it. We just saw the blueprint. So, yeah. Let me set the bar low on it. No, no. don't, don't. It's going to be great. It's going to, yeah. It's There's gonna an interactive element There's tomorrow. There's an interactive too. element to some of the entrances, too. I'm giving away too much, aren't yeah. I? Be quiet. <laughs> 
They're mad at me already. Yeah, this is you're doing it now. I usually do this. That's usually me. <laughs> Spoiling things. Let me spoil something. No, what? don't. Okay. Well, okay, so in about five minutes, we're going to do a Q&A. So if you guys do have some questions, um, you can start lining up. I hope you do. I can't see if anybody does. But uh, until we get there, um, we'll talk a little bit more about Dynamite. October 2nd, our first run on TNT. Yeah. And how, th how things changed, you know, because we did have five, uh, you know, five months to, to prepare, six months to prepare for Double or Nothing, but then we had less time to prepare for Fighter Fest, Fight for the Fallen, and then even less time to start going weekly. I thought Double or Nothing was scary. Uh, being at the building that day for the first TV live, that was the most scared I've ever been before a show. Just because the live element is so so much different, you know, and I, I you had the same feeling. Oh, I was terrified. Uh, it, like, it, is everyone gonna hit their times? Is someone gonna go over time? Like it, it was all learning on the fly. I was even gonna go before that when we were about a month or two out, and we didn't have a title for the show, and the network wanted Revolution. They wanted, which is. We ended up getting the trademark, so that's what the show's tomorrow. But I also wanted Revolution. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and Nick and I were like, hell no. Because I said it in a <laughs> see, promo. See, Tony was writing up these shows literally 20 years ago. 14-year-old Tony Khan doing has shows. a thing called Wednesday Night Dynamite. Yeah, yes. when, and I saw that, and I knew we had to keep his vision alive and, and make it right. He had to this fight, This is what though. he saw. and. It was it was a huge fight to get the name Dynamite. The network didn't like it. Well, so so this was our first experience too. Like we were used to having the type of creative freedom. We you know Double or Nothing was named internally all this stuff. But as soon as we started working with Turner, then we had to have like focus groups yeah. and you know market testing and things like that. And and so that was a big wake up call. But after the testing, everyone said yeah, Dynamite won. Second yeah. set of testing, they and they got the results back and they were like, okay, they liked it. Yeah. You guys haven't lived until you've been on a marketing call. <laughs> Does anybody want the dial-in number? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> you haven't Every Monday. until you've been on a marketing call. I was, uh, was going to say that first TV uh, in D.C. and that being such a large play building and to have that sell out, I, I typically I feel like when the red light's on or I, I really like to have a sense of occasion or have something to say or, or, or be prepared or at least pretend to be prepared. But when I got on my little elevator – and Brandy got on next to me because in the elevator I'm like I'm like bent down like this. Uh, she said, uh, "I'm I'm so proud. What are you thinking?" And this is like right before we went out. Oh, man. Yeah. And I'll regret it to this day. I literally just went, uh, uh, and then the music started. <laughs> like I, I never said anything. Yeah. She was so calm and poised uh, and cool, and I I had nothing to say because yeah. I was blown it was away. Scary, man. It was scary. And when you're we were watching at the go position. And the crowd was just going so nuts. You guys locked up for the first time, and you you started the match, yeah. and it went Oof. it went great. And when that first match went great, I was like, okay, there's a little bit relief because now we we hit our times. The crowd's into it. We're doing this. Well, the crowd. I was gonna say, and now we're 20 weeks in or whatever we are, and the crowd is just yeah. as hot. Every they're, single well, people. they're a part of the show. Yeah, yeah. I told uh, we, men part. we mentioned the marketing calls and the thrill of the marketing call. One thing I told uh, when we were all together in LA, actually, I, I, I was very specific. This was with the highest of the high at the Warner Media family. I said the most overstar on our show, other than Chris Jericho, is the audience. Yeah. Uh, and, and and they and Orange Cassidy and now Cassidy, Orange yeah. Cassidy. Uh, but yeah, no, and they've got Kansas City. They were hot. That was Kansas City was every, every week, yeah. though. Man, you know, every, town, I was, every week's been so. You know cool. me, man. I Kansas City was tough. But you know what? There hasn't been one week where like all of us said, "Man, that that crowd sucked tonight." We have not. We not have once. So, <laughs> so Chicago so who tomorrow. Will uh, <laughs> the challenge has been laid out. Yeah, Chicago the has been laid out. Chicago's always great. No, we have not had one. Uh, we've had different types of crowds uh but but kansas city last week was so hot how about that iron man it was actually match? like two days yeah. ago jeez yeah geez. <laughs> it was i'll go on record and say that was probably the best tv match that's ever been on national television that's so good so along those lines about the audience being part of the show the, um, and you know because there is no prototype because there's no blueprint and aew you guys, Matt and Nick specifically, 
would not be here without the, the support of the fans, without you, know, you guys doing meet and greets and staying till every single last person got every piece of merchandise signed. And so I think that's, that's an important thing is respecting our roots. And you know, we don't wanna, it, we wanna have the wrestlers to have creativity, we wanna have the production staff to have creativity, but we want the fans to also be able to creatively express themselves. That's why we're doing things like this still to this day and we're about to go do a meet and greet and autographs it, that's the reason why we've built this audience is from the support from you fans. I, and we we can never get enough of it. I think specifically too, like I think it's one of the reasons uh, we talk about. Like I talked about Kenny earlier, but one of the reasons that I've always lo- loved Matt and Nick is how we've handled meet and greets. Vastly different individuals, vastly different personalities. Uh, I I've I've made plenty of mistakes with how I communicate with people. Nasty text messages from time to time, but that. This has never, it's a constant reminder of like these guys want the exact same thing I want. And I have a rule, and this is something I got from WWE, but I've, I've carried it forward, is you can judge somebody by how they handle a meet and greet. Like, you weren't famous five seconds ago. Now you're on TV and you're famous and you're telling people no at the airport and you're saying, like, screw that like this is this isn't you have a finite amount of time on earth like which is why i love these guys so much uh, because because at roh your guy their your music would be playing and you would still be signing and still be doing a meet and, and greet and we haven't even called our match yeah, yeah. and our gear and <laughs> K-fabe. get out there kayfabe man so speaking to the audience let's open it up to you guys for a little bit of q and a um i think we've got two mics um start up start over there on the left or right whichever i don't know i'm on stage it's all it's all backwards now how's it going guys uh my name is markel um i'm from jersey uh i just wanted to make a comment first before my question i will definitely say that you cody have made me a believer because i've been a wrestling fan my entire life and when somebody told me that stardust was going to be creating their own thing i was just like no way and then i watched you without that whole gimmick and i've watched what you've done now and i'm pretty sure the audience here can agree you recently cut a promo for jericho that was one of the greatest promos i've seen cut in a ring like you bar none you know your promo was better than some of the shows i've seen from the the competition um but that's that's not my question so my question to everybody is uh in terms of the promos and how cool your promo is cody um have you guys ever had uh, what's like what's your most embarrassing moment do, uh, like while coming out like you know if, if you tripped or fall or something happened behind the scenes or what's your most embarrassing moment coming to the stage? Oh, there's there's that week that elevator didn't work. <laughs> oh, that was that's right. That did happen. Yeah, the elevator, the, the, the elevator didn't work. I, I most embarrassing. I'll give you most embarrassing dynamite moment for me. So thank you very much for what you said about the interviews. I think wrestling interviews are very important. I think they are just as much a part of pro wrestling as the actual wrestling. Yes. Um, so I, I, I'm glad that that one resonated with folks in the way it did. And so most embarrassing Dynamite era moment. I know what I think is the overall most embarrassing moment, but it doesn't include me. My personal one was I went to Power Slam Nobody <laughs> with... Uh, <laughs> with Chris Jericho the night after Full Gear. Oh. And then I'll double up. Big Pizza Andy from Butcher Blade and Bunny. Andy, I went to dive That's on right. nobody. <laughs> so I ran basically running straight at you, but imagine there's nothing there. He was on the floor ho- hoping he's going to get up, buddy. <laughs> and he never gets up. I felt so bad for the power slam one because you just had that terrible cut on your forehead. Yeah, my face is all up, and I, you know. <laughs> and you came backstage and you went right to me. You go, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I right. go, oh, it wasn't that bad, and then, <laughs> I, then I watched <laughs> it back, and then I went, oh, poor Cody. So bad. <laughs> and QT, QT Marshall, who God bless his soul, like I wish he had a better bedside manner, but he, I, I go, what? Well, how was it? He goes, it was bad. <laughs> Brutally Ooh. honest QT Marshall. <laughs> you know, thanks for what being honest. <laughs> I once, I, th- this is every wrestler's nightmare. It's like when you just, you, you come through the curtain all energetic and then you just slip and fall right on your ass. <laughs> that happened to me at a PWG show in Burbank. Really? And I remember I just fell down and immediately my instinct was like, 
nip up. And I nipped up, I'm like, yeah, baby, come on. And everybody's just like not buying it. They're like, no, man, you fell down. You fell down, dude. I think my most embarrassing moment would be at an independent called Beyond Wrestling. Uh, we had built this this tag match with, uh, I, don't, I don't remember who it was, but it was a good like 20 minute match. And this was the finish of the match. These ropes were so high, they're up to my face. And Matt has the guy up for a Meltzer driver. I'm like, I, I just have to springboard and finish this thing. That, that's it. That's all I have to do. I springboard, and I couldn't get my feet up. I slip, and Matt goes, oh, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> so, so I try to, like, overcompensate, do, like, a 360 tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. So that was the worst. Uh, Nick just falls right in front of me, and I look at him. I felt so bad for him. <laughs> Do you remember the one of our last Ring of Honor shows? You guys asked me to springboard dropkick in, and I couldn't. <laughs> That's I, right. I was, I was too blown up. So instead of springboard dropkicking in, imagine just I vaulted the ropes and That's just right. stuck my legs out. <laughs> yeah, that was another instance where you came up to me all, but that wasn't that bad, right? I was like, oh, <laughs> and then the lethal injection to this day, I did one lethal injection in my whole life, and I asked Nick, but I can't tell if he's messing with me. Like, it was okay, right? I, it was the slowest lethal injection of all time. The Tajiri on the rope? Uh, oh, man. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, that was an embarrassing part. You, all three of us together. No, no, no. After that match. Ooh. I was our send-off. Our send-off send <laughs> in Philly for Ring of Honor, which to me, I did not expect a big send-off. I was there for two years. I pretty much was how I am for two years, so I don't think anyone was going to miss me. Uh, but these guys put, like, their life there. And they the last image was you crawling out after Papa kicked all our asses. Right. <laughs> Nick's just crawling on the floor, a dirty floor in the ECW arena. <laughs> and, he's, and I think you looked at me, and I think trying to calm you down, I said, we will never be here again. <laughs> And then you came through the all on the floor having yeah, a conversation. Yeah, you're all crawling. But yeah, we came right. through the curtain, and one person was crying and sad. And his name was Marty. It was Marty. <laughs> <laughs> there was, was nobody else. I don't know what I'm gonna do, mate. Uh, <laughs> mate. What am I gonna do, what mate? What am I gonna do? You guys are leaving me, mate. You're all dead, oh, mate. <laughs> okay, we only we've, we love Marty. We do, we do. <laughs> but we've only got about 18 minutes left, right. and. So I know there's a lot of people in line for Q&A, so if you guys can, can be br brief and concise, we want to try to get to as many of you as possible, so please and thank you. We will try to be as brief and concise. Rapid fire. Yes. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, what's going on? Uh, my name is Eric. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, but I live here in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I saw you guys at AEW Cleveland. Cody, you stole my phone for that group selfie after the show. So my main question is, and there's no rush about this, what is currently the update? about AEW Dynamite or even a pay-per-view in Mexico or the UK or maybe the greatest country on earth, Canada? Uh, I can not... Are you trying to refer this to me right now? You're looking at me. Well, I'm just non-spoilery. Oh, that's right. Non-spoilery. I said in an interview the other day, 2020 for sure, UK. Woo! Very likely three different cities. Cool. But this is for sure, 2020 UK. Canada, uh, we have a great partner in TSN, so we would love. You guys get huge ratings, by the way, on TSN. Also, Tony <laughs> owns the Four Seasons. He owns it. He'll definitely let you know. He'll let you it. know he owns it. Um, <laughs> yeah, whenever Toronto's mentioned, oh, I, I, would, own the, I would think I own the Four Seasons. I would think I would, uh, you know, if you, Eric, is that your name? Yeah. I bet you a hundred dollars. I'll give you $100 if we don't make it to Canada this year. For sure, we're trying to get to Canada this year. $100 U.S. I'm on Canadian. Twitter, the elite era. You there it is. We've made our bet, $100. If we don't make it, you owe me nothing if we do make it. Pretty sure we're going to make it because Toronto, Montreal, even Pacific Northwest. Even uh, Winnipeg for Jericho and Omega for oh. homecoming. Toronto's real nice during the summer, huh? It is. Yeah. And Toronto had Rico. Would, I'm, these aren't. Re I'm not even getting into the rapid fire element of that. Oh, Rico, I know. This is, this is going off. I fell in love with my wife in the Air Canada Center parking lot. You want to know why? I'm all she, ears. Uh, she got the indication I was into her, and she decided to uh, shoot her shot. And I gave, uh, I gave Oksana like the half hug as we were leaving. We're in the Air Canada. We're in the parking lot. And then I gave Brandy a hug, 
and she blew in my ear. Ooh. And I knew, I knew, I was like, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Didn't happen for like months later, but I, okay. I knew in my heart. Next question. <laughs> Hello, I am the great Papyrus and I have a question for you. How, how exactly did my brother Sam end movie? up on your show? Yeah. One more time. How exactly did my brother Sam end up on your show? Not one person understood that, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, yeah, was, yeah. Close. Yeah. So uh, there was one episode where uh, Kenny Omega came in dressed as Sans from Undertale. Yes. How did that come together? Uh, same way the barbed wire bat came together, <laughs> the poker chips came together, zero knowledge of it, people on the headsets going, what, what? And the answer is Kenny Omega. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He was very he was very happy to represent Undertale and he actually had asked all of us like I hope it resonated because we have to look at a bazillion charts on Thursdays and it did. People yeah, to to the audience that loves him very much, it was it was a really cool little Easter egg. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Hey, I'm uh, Glenn, I'm from Chicago and I had a all in question actually. Um I was wondering if there was an like alternative plan originally for Flip Gordon to get into the show, because I asked because there was a um, all out Flip's all out party originally scheduled for the Vic Theater in Chicago, which is like in the city, and it was scheduled for the day of the show at 6 p.m. when the show started, and then that all out party was moved to the Sears Center parking lot like the morning of. I'm but... gonna tell you this straight up. <laughs> I hate. Flip Gordon. <laughs> but Matt and Nick just love him. He's their little son. He, he's he got a dog like my dog. He's tried to copy my life. Uh, big flat earther. What was, well, you guys, <laughs> flat earther. You guys handled all Flip's arrangements, right? Yeah. That was the idea the whole time, actually. He was going to leave the theater and still make the match because yeah. he was going to fool people into thinking, like, there's no way he'll be there. That's it, what I was wondering. He yeah. was ultimately, yeah. for a long time, we wrote the idea about the Battle Royale, and he was always going to, you know, somehow get involved and win it. I don't know if it, it all came together. Like, when did it come together that he was going to wear the hood and he was going to be the character, though? About was, a month before that. Okay. But, yeah, we, we always knew Flip was going to end up getting on the show somehow, and then... Eventually, we came up with the idea about the battle run. It's to this day, man. What a prop, great, huh? One yeah. of my favorite yeah. moments. What a great picture, looked. too, of him in the yeah. corner. It was a, it was a special moment. Yeah, right. he cried at, afterward in the back and held us. He's like, that was, I don't what do you do after that? How do you top that? Didn't cry to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, next question, please. Hello, my name's John from Indiana, and I love how with AEW, you have got such a blend of the old and the new, um, so many things that we never thought we'd ever see. Uh, one of the most amazing segments, sadly, with you getting lashed, but it was an amazing segment. My question is, um, with this blend from the old and the new, are there any what would be considered old-time matches that you have not seen that you may want to try to resurrect? I mean, you had the cage match. Of course, that's not necessarily old, but is there anything that you'd like to bring back? If you watch the... Uh, go ahead, go ahead. If you watch the pay-per-view tomorrow, we're probably gonna be announcing a very old school match that's probably gonna make some other people very, very mad. <laughs> but it's AEW. And we're doing it anyways, baby. And, and let me. And if if, you, if that sizzle does not run on the show, it's because we're over time. So it just it's still gonna happen. Oh, so we're doing Hell in a Cell? No, come on. <laughs> Speaking of Hell in a Cell, though, who designed our? I just put over all the nice production people. The cage was way too high. Like <laughs> what? What guy thought like, oh, it needs the extra three Two feet? feet. <laughs> get the. F I remember that night, like we they lowered the cage and we get in there and and we're looking at Nick and I are just looking at it like this is ridiculous. I tried climbing it, then I was like, oh my god, this is too high for me. Yeah, so we so we see Cody standing outside the ring and you can just see he's just he's a mess. <laughs> and, Disgusting. And we said, dude, you're not doing the moonsault off that thing, right? Like you cut that. He's like, oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> 
Like, how are you going to get up there? People paid their money, then, you know what I'm saying? I'm, so we're watching from the back in the go position, and you fall off this thing, and I swear to God, it looks like a human body falling off of a building. <laughs> it but looks like, like... The body... It's like a, like it a look, dummy. It looks like the Kermit video where they throw... <laughs> where they throw Kermit. And he just, yes. Your legs are, like, flailing. I'm like, what is going on? It was I you guys want to see I lost my uh, toe? No, off. nobody wants, to, nobody see wants to see that. Are you taking your shit? It's grotesque if you can't see it. All right, man, that's great. Down in front. All right, next question. Uh, okay, uh, next one. Uh, Jeremy from Miami, Florida. Uh, um, we know you're on Crash Course with the inner, inner Circle at some point. Whose idea was that behind the scenes to put Jericho with a group like that? Jericho. <laughs> no, no, you know what? Uh, the day after All In, we had a secret meeting with Tony and his father, Matt, and myself. Brandon Cutler was in there. Uh, who else was in there? It might have just been. A, it was a small. Group. Like Brandon, he's right there. Get on stage, yeah. Brandon. Yeah. Your ass up here, Brandon. Double bye. Double bye. Get set. up here. Show him a double bye. So Nick can get his. Nick's trying to answer a question. You're stealing the spot. Right in the yeah, center. Brandon. Center stage. Double bye. Yeah. And uh, you know what, uh, that night, Matt and I and Tony were actually discussing storylines, and the idea was for the elite to feud with Jericho and a group. So it was actually that day. We didn't know who would be in the group, and that all kind of just slowly came together. But we knew that episode it, yeah. one was going to end with a big cliffhanger with a new big wrestling group headed by probably Chris Jericho. Very early on. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Okay. Next one. Yo, my name is Mark. I'm from uh, the Burbs in Chicago. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah Schomburg. <laughs> but, but anywho, I, I just want to say first, I got mad respects for all of you, especially you, Cody. Anyone who could carry Randy Orton to a decent match is... Whoa. <laughs> Facts. 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 Uh, Damn. But well, well, seriously, seriously, I got mad respects for all of you, and I just, and I like the question from our little papyrus back there. But I was, and I noticed that you, that you, the young bucks were in uh, Ken and Ryu outfits during that during that whole Halloween episode. So I just wanted to ask, who do you guys, who would you guys consider to be your uh, Smash spirits? Smash Brothers. I can tell you they don't. Probably. Yeah, this is this is not a question aimed at them. So who would be like who would they smash main? Yeah, why don't you tell uh, us, Cody? But, who do you think? Well, I mean, like who do you who would you guys relate to? I mean, like I think I got kind of got a feeling about about you, Cody, because I remember uh, what that insignia you had on your wrestling boots. But it's got to be a specific link, uh, and I don't know. I believe the the latest Smash has. I somehow fell in love with Toon Link. Uh, I, th I think Toon Link is really, really special. Uh, you guys, I'm going to just get him to do it for you. Uh, yeah, do it for us. Yeah, I have very, no idea. very because of your current relationship. One of them is, is, is Mario, and the other one is Luigi. Oh, come on. I hey. was thinking like a I didn't Isabel say who. That's an easy I didn't say who it was represented by who. I also dressed up as Bowser on the cruise ship, the first Jericho cruise, and hurt myself in the Bowser outfit, so that was fun. <laughs> what a mess that was. <laughs> TNA was so mad. <laughs> no, anyways, we went, never mind. No. And if you guys enjoyed the, uh, the, the little Street Fighter collab, uh, keep your eye open because we've, we yeah. made some friends at Capcom, so. Yeah, you know. yeah. Not, no, this is not video game related. Ooh. This is not video game related. I sorry, made... sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I made a big friend at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Toy Fair, big, big friend, and I would love to see it come to fruition here uh, in the future with perhaps some entrance stuff, so I'm not giving anything away. But there, the cross-promotion, because there's so many people in the gaming world that genuinely like the real, actual gaming world and eSports and their uprising, and you know you got guys like Golden Boy and you have guys like Kenny, like, we will continue to have synergy with groups like that because they really share a lot of the same fans. Thank you. Good luck. 
Hi, happy Friday. My name is Donald Taylor. Um, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I have a question for Cincinnati. I have to ask it for Cincinnati. What side of town is John Moxley from, and when is the, and is there any update on the AEW video game? Oh. <laughs> Facts. No. Kenny Omega. <laughs> um, if Kenny Omega was on the panel, he would have a better answer for that. It's okay. Right. You guys want an AEW video game? Yes. 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 I bought 2K20. <laughs> Cody, you don't do it. You can't give it to him. You can't give it to him, brother. You guys, you guys want an AEW video game, right? No, Cody, don't do it. Don't do it. Anything that you guys have wanted from us, we have made great efforts to to do for you, and I feel like we pretty much have kind of always done so when it comes to the video game the thing that i will say this is there is a very specific type of game that people want there's a very specific engine that people want and and i will say that it takes time so just be patient and i bet kenny omega will provide a wonderful announcement sometime soon that has a lot more details and less vague and when it comes to Cincinnati, I have no clue about the boroughs and how Cincinnati works in general. West or East works. He's West or, is he a West or East guy? Yeah. Is he West or East, does he say? Take a shot. I have no idea. Yes. Anyone in front, anyone know Mox? Amelia. He's the Amelia? Amelia? Yeah. Oh, he's supposed to be a West Side. Oh, yeah, he's West Side, bro. <laughs> hey, he's West Side. <laughs> That's not the same thing, Cody. Okay, we've got uh, just under four minutes, so let's if we can if we can fire through, just try to get as many of you guys up as possible. All right. My name's Nathan, and my question is hopefully for all of you, if Excalibur you want to answer too. Who is one person in the independent wrestling scene that you guys just want for AEW? Like someone you gotta have. Dan Housen, yes. <laughs> okay. That's tough. I'll actually you mentioned Dan Housen, right? Uh, I had to ask Ethan Page who it was because he's all over my Twitter feed <laughs> constantly, but that's probably going to be the guy. These two are the DIY guys of, 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 of all of this. Yeah, but that's – we mentioned Dan Housen, like, he's, he's an impact guy, but – Yeah, he still does the independent stuff. Oh, so. But he's, Ethan Page is somebody that's very special. I think he has a lot to offer. You guys just tell us. Last week I got on a conference call talking about who I wanted, and I mentioned Chris Chris Bay, and then I got a text. I got a text five minutes later, like, "Oh man, I just signed with Impact." Ah! Excalibur has a great eye for it because he's think? still announcing for PWG, and that's the place for him. Who is it, Mark? Who would you say is the guy to grab right now? Who is it? On the spot. You kind of uh, got everybody already, huh? <laughs> I like Aramis. Yeah. Mexico. Oh, okay. Like, oh, my God. Like he's what about you? What, what would you say? Oh, uh, Dan Housen, of course. Or Warhorse. Warhorse is, yeah. Very you nice, guys are both evil. Dan Housen and Warhorse guys, huh? Yeah. I'll look at both of them. I uh, Because I'm good friends with Julian and they're good friends with Woola, I'll actually try and get up close and personal with both of them. I know Dan Housen's done some ROH stuff, but so we'll look at him. All right. Thank you. Next up. Hi. Uh, I'm Matt from Champaign, Illinois. Um, ILL. Um, my question is for Cody. Uh, it's a very specific question. Um, you were very quick to reject uh, Chuck E. T.'s request to say the S word on AEW Dynamite on TNT, and I was just wondering why. Do you guys want Chuck Taylor to say the S word on Dynamite? 100% emphatically no. <laughs> we only get so many S words a dynamite. And Chuck is such a sweet man. I don't think he needs it, but I have a feeling he's going to go over my head at a certain point here, go over everyone's head. He's itching. He's itching to do it. So don't be surprised if he does. He had a live mic on Wednesday. He could have took advantage he of it. He didn't, though, yeah? But Maybe Cody, do let him say as, it. as one of our three great announcers said, You've got to give the people what they want. <laughs> I, you I guys have, want Chuck uh, Taylor <laughs> to say shit on the air? Yeah! 
I think it'd be funny if we build this really long-term story where we finally hand him a mic and we're going to have this big moment and he gets it and then he really just literally says S-word. So when you guys see yeah, Chuck Taylor, fit. just start chanting, shit, shit, shit. Yeah, if you guys Actually, want, don't do that. Don't do that. That's you guys want it, we'll try, and, we'll try and give it to you. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'll take it under consideration. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you. Unfortunately, we, we are all out of time. I want to thank each and every one of you guys for being here. Thank I you, I hope guys. to see each and one of, every one of you at Revolution tomorrow night. And most importantly, I want to thank Cody, Nick Jackson, Matt Jackson, the elite. Thank you, guys.